Girls and guests, will you please give a very, very warm welcome to Lauren McNally, our guest speaker. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by briefly extending my thanks to the school for inviting me here today. Um, it really is a privilege, uh, as I'm sure you know, to be asked to address you this afternoon. Um, I was actually lucky enough to get the chance to meet a few of you yesterday in, in the library and out on the quad, um, and it was just so great to kind of get an idea of, of the breadth of your achievements today and to kind of see your enthusiasm firsthand, so thank you so much for that. Um, so, Beverly's already kindly introduced me, but um, by way of just further brief introduction, uh, my name is Lauren, um, I'm an engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is based in Pasadena, California, so it's in LA County. Um, for nearly three years now, I've worked in the flight communication system section, where, among other things, I've had the good fortune to work on things like telecom system design um, of a lightweight helicopter drone that will be heading to Mars on the next rover, um, and more recently, um, a laser communication terminal, uh, and that aims to deliver data back from deep space just many times faster than your conventional radio system. Um, now, as to what that actually entails, um, day to day, I write code, I design circuit boards, I spend days tearing my own hair out in a lab when things don't go work, which unfortunately is more often than not, and you know, jumping for joy when they actually do. I'm 27 years old, which makes it only nine years since I last sat in this hall. And very honestly, being on this side of the stage is terrifying. Um, I've spent the last few weeks trying and failing to remember a time where I last had to do something like this. So today, students, teachers, parents, and esteemed guests, I give you the dubious honor of witnessing my first public speaking attempt since English GCSE. <laughs> and by the way, I got a solid B minus in that one coursework, so fingers crossed we'll again attain those dizzying heights. Um, I've lately taken to making kind of private promises to myself, um, sort of as an effort to hold myself accountable somehow to all those small things that are kind of so easy to let go of in life and that I'm especially culpable of. You know, things like, I promise to answer all of my emails and texts in 24 hours. I promise to go for a run. You know, I promise to eat less cheese. You know, things like this don't always work, um, but it does try and give me a, a reason to stay on track. And so I figured that in the spirit of this tradition, um, I'd begin this speech by telling you three things that I promised myself when I was preparing it. Now, the first was to speak to you sincerely. The second was to try to offer as best as I can, some kind of useful advice, you know, advice that hopefully isn't, but probably is something you've heard a million times before. And the final promise, both for your sake and for mine, is to speak for no longer than 10 minutes. So in the spirit of the second promise, you know, to try and give you some fresh advice, I went to the internet to help me in a sort of, you know, a sort of reverse plagiarism exercise. I was going to see what people were normally talking about and see if I could do anything different. Um, and I watched countless speech day style videos on YouTube given by people like, you know, JK Rowling, Michelle Obama. My personal favorite was one done by Will Ferrell. Um, and I found that, you know, generally these guys are all trying to speak to, to fairly similar things. It's things like, you know, reach for the stars, uh, follow your dreams, don't listen to the critics. Now, these are all admirable sentiments, um, and I hope that you all have the good fortune to be told things like this on a regular basis. And a part of me imagines that this has got to be true. I mean, each and every one of you is, in part, sat in this hall today because there is somebody out there who values your education, who believes you have the capability to achieve, and who sincerely wants the best for you in life. I think it is worth taking a moment to recognize just how lucky, and at some times uncommon, sadly, this can be. And so, you know, given that these are the points people are normally talking about, I thought it might be worth, you know, speaking to the, the other side um, of these, where often anxiety is coming. Things like, you know, how do you follow a dream that hasn't formed yet? 
Uh, are your critics ever just trying to give you valuable advice? And what happens to us if we fall a little short or even fail to meet our goals? As has been said, it's been nine years since I last sat in this hall, and I know that nine years ago, I certainly didn't have a passion or a plan, no grand dream, and it would be disingenuous of me to claim that I did. I think at best I left school with a vague notion that engineering might be a good thing to try. Uh, you know, I wasn't particularly confident in this, but I'm thankful that I think, you know, the school at least instilled in me um, just enough confidence to crucially give something a try. And as an aside, you know, trying, trying small things incrementally is actually a pretty brave and worthwhile pursuit. You don't know where they might lead, um, and I found that any grand task becomes infinitely more manageable when you break it down into its constituent pieces. So I suppose I'd say really, you know, if you have a dream, that is great. Um, and if you don't, don't worry, you're in good and numerous company. Try instead, if you can, to work on fostering that small bit of confidence that helps you take those small and very necessary steps towards a larger goal. Now, in terms of that point about reaching for the stars, I actually think that the pressure to succeed is a heavy burden at times. You know, I've, I've found that many of the people around me, and it's, it's colleagues, it's my own siblings, it's friends, all feel it very keenly. And I feel like a lot of us have gotten this idea that we have to succeed in this kind of arbitrary way in order to have value, and that, by the way, we should have succeeded yesterday. Like, you know, if you're not grade eight by the time you're 16 and float, and, you, you know, don't touch an instrument again kind of thing. And that this push to succeed extends to, to all aspects of a person's life. You know, that you've somehow now got to get all A stars, win gold at the Winter Olympics, and broke a world peace, all while having a really great pair of eyebrows. <laughs> now, I'm not trying to dissuade you from being ambitious. Like, I think that is just, just brilliant to want to be the best possible version of yourself. It's just that I think sometimes, ironically, this, this striving for relentless achievement can be distracting enough that you miss or otherwise turn down the opportunity that might have led you to true fulfillment in life just because it doesn't look the way you imagined it would. From a young age, we're told not to judge a book by its cover. And I tell you, don't judge a job that way either. Stack the shelves at Tesco, you know, walk dogs, volunteer, and not just because you think it'll look good on your CV or UCAS. Take pride in doing these seemingly unexceptional things. You know, as your parents will probably tell you, and at least as, as my mom and dad told me, you know, just getting up every morning and going to do any job or any schoolwork is pretty exceptional in and of itself. Now, finally, this, this idea of, you know, not listening to your critics. Now, I found this was one was kind of too hard to, to come up with the other side to because I really can't get past the feeling that, you know, if you're anything like me, then in high school you're probably spending, you know, a bit too much time than you should be listening to critics. Um, and there's one very dangerous critic in particular that I tell you to ignore, and that's your inner critic. Uh, this is something that I think everyone is prone to, but it's, it's worth noting that a lack of self-belief is routinely cited as the main reason that we have you know, fewer women in the sciences and engineering and, and fewer female leaders. You know, it's funny, I remember that, that during my final year at university, um, as I approached graduation, that I was adamant that I wasn't an engineer, uh, that I was just no good at the subject, um, and that I'd just be much better served doing something else. I went to Imperial College in London, and I was surrounded by just all of these really bright kids and they were just, you know, so passionate and motivated by the subject in a way that I truly admire. And I felt, you know, kind of out on a limb, like I hadn't really clicked yet. And I actually, ironically, prepared all of these applications for things like, you know, law conversion courses, um, like even advertising and accountancy and things. And I had this... Uh, this little insistent thought, thankfully, that it, it might be worth submitting at least one application for something engineering related. And uh, looking back, I'm just, just so thankful that I did. I think in hindsight, this stemmed from a lack of confidence and uh, perhaps even a lack of imagination. 
I think it's really hard when you're young to, to conceive of a world beyond your classroom and to believe that you might, through time and experience, become better at or more attuned to a thing than you are now. I've been doing a, a kind of informal survey lately of some of my work colleagues, you know, trying to find out how they got to where they are now, uh, what motivates them, and at what age, if ever, did they know that this was the thing they wanted to do for the rest of their lives. In some, or you know, perhaps the majority, fairly, of cases, the staff have followed what I'd call the conventional route. You know, they were academically gifted children who went on to good universities and got a train of increasingly great jobs. Uh, my own path is not that dissimilar, albeit with a few bumps along the, right, the way. Worth a special mention, however, are those who have trod a more uncommon path. I know an engineer who first trained as a concert pianist. A scientist who was actually majoring in economics when they had their career plans just totally upended by their first elective physics lecture. And a person who, you know, they didn't even go to college until they hit 30, just because they realized, you know, a little later in life that working in assembly wasn't really doing anything for them. You know, I've run into to people who got started building special effects for the movie industry, who grew up in communities with next to no amenities, you know, people even who as teenagers got school reports home that said, you know, in, in spite of all their best efforts, they were clearly going to struggle to get any kind of good grades in maths. And working with them, I think, you know, thank God they didn't have some weird notion or idea that, you know, just because things hadn't necessarily worked in their favor thus far, that they should never even try to do better. So remember, don't count yourself out too early, and that you don't have to do anything sensational to have value, you have that inherently, and that no matter how scary or tiring or difficult it may be, keep trying, you'll do just fine. Thank you very much for listening.